This is a Momentum Media production. Inside Commercial Property with Rethink Investing. Australia's largest and most comprehensive podcast covering all things commercial investing. Today, hey guys, Phil Tarrant here. You are the other hopes of Inside Commercial Property. How are you going? Uh, I'm recording from Melbourne doing some on the ground truth, working out what's happening with commercial markets down here. And I'm sitting out looking over the Docklands at the moment. I have a couple of observations I've been in for the last couple of days. Number one, it's a soulless place. Number two, you can't get a kebab at 12 o'clock at night when you really, really need one. And number three, I really think the amenities in this place are pretty poor. I'm looking out over the uh, over the, uh, the water here and um, a lot of cookie cutter apartments, resi apartments. Uh, but it's a really, it's interesting, it's got a straight line into um, commercial property. So it's a, a real microcosm of probably markets right across Australia where walking a couple of blocks completely changes the footprint, uh, the asset classes and how people can invest in property. But uh, I reckon there's a lot of people that bought property down here in Docklands many, many years ago and they're still probably sitting around, even though property's gone up. Uh, by a significant amount of money over the last few years, sitting around still waiting to get the money back. But that's more of a resi property discussion. We're here to talk about commercial property. Joining me, Scott O'Neill, Director, Rethink Investing. How you going? That sounds like a Kiwi, Investing. Scott, how are you going? Yeah. yeah, very good, mate. Nice uh, high start for the Melbournians this morning. So, I know, yeah, mate. I know. It is. It Got is. a few uh, <laughs> Melbourne people that work for us. They wouldn't be happy. <laughs> but uh, could, have, could have a bag, don't you? Sydney yeah, you do. Conflict, I love it. Oh, yeah, look, it's okay down here. Um, uh, did you ever buy an apartment in Docklands? No, no, mate. I uh, avoid the high-rise units with all, uh, yeah, at any cost, really. Never really saw it as a, an option, but, yeah, nice shiny off the plan. It does suck a few people in, doesn't it? Oh, it does. And you can come in and these, there's, I don't know how many of these big high-rises there are down here. There's a concierge person, there's a pool, there's a gym, there's lots of car parking. It's, um, you know, you could live here, but uh, I just think you'd be pretty bored. Uh, there's not a lot to do. Uh, that said, there's a train junction, what do you call it, a tram junction right down here, get you into town pretty quickly. If you're a, a young executive working 70-hour days in the city, it probably makes sense, so I get it, but um, whether or not it's an investment property, I'm not too sure, mate. Yeah, and definitely, look, we're not really big in the commercial side of things down in Melbourne, and really it's just because of the yields, like, it's got the lowest yields in the country and there's uh, like it's hard to explain why um we've kind of brought it up before and in other media sources it it seems like it's almost a culture thing like there is a greater buyer sentiment versus renter sentiment down there than sydney for example that may have a little bit to do with the prices but it really does drive yields down when you've got slightly more uh, buyers versus uh, renters it's um yeah culturally you can accept a lower yield than than you would anywhere else in the country so yeah, it's not a not a great place for a positively geared property, and hence why uh, my company doesn't really kind of you know play in that field too much. That's fair enough. And uh, I, I've got resi property down here. I don't have any commercial property, but you know, uh, there's a lot of Australian investors now. Um, consecutive rate rises. Uh, we're at, nearing the top of the interest rate cycle. We're at the terminal rate yet. Yeah, I'm not too sure. There's maybe one or two more uh, 25 basis points uh, increases. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of noise now coming starting to come out around. The impact of the cost of living increases, uh, particularly how that applies to mortgages and rents. So, uh, renters and both mortgage holders are feeling the impact. And that's very much the goal of the Reserve Bank of Australia to stimulate that sort of activity. They want people to slow down. They want to curb spending and lending uh, to get a, a hold on inflation, Scott. Um, but this is about commercial property rather than residential property. You can't talk about the two in isolation. They're intrinsically connected and linked, particularly for those people who typically kick off and we've spoken about it, investing in resi property and then make the shift in, into commercial property. I, I own both commercial and residential assets. Uh, to me, it's got commercial property was really a, attractive prior to these interest rates coming up. I imagine now there's a lot of commercial investors who have got in over the last couple of years uh, who have seen that the cash return on their commercial investments uh, be eroded pretty quickly by rising interest rates. If you're a cash buyer in commercial, I think it's good times ahead. If you're smart, proactive, strategic, you can you can skill really good assets today for preparation for tomorrow. But for leveraged commercial investors, the question is, Scott, is it a good time to be investing in commercial property? Yeah, really good question. And there's there's a few parts to it. And 
high level, it is a very good time because you are going to get a discount than you did last year. You know, it's probably seen a 0.75% basis points decompression of the yield. So if a yielding property was 6% last year net, you're probably going to get that thing at uh, 6.75%. So all of a sudden, that's a pretty good yield. The yield expansions come from two particular areas. One is rental growth. So we're seeing the best rental growth rates in over a decade. And it's really off the back of everything that's going on with uh, the economy. So building costs have gone up. That filters down into less supply. Uh, You've got interest rates that have gone up. That makes vendors and owners more... I guess the probability of them trying to push rents up is higher. So that will actually, over time, push rents up higher as well. Even things like insurance premiums and all that kind of stuff, costs have just gone up. So it all does filter down into the leasing value in time. So that is a a really good sign for capital growth because, as you know, for commercial property, the rent is the baseline for a lot of the valuation. So if rents go up, so does the value. So right Now we're seeing that rental growth that we so desperately needed over the last 10 years because all the growth coming out of commercial was really just from yield compression, which is almost like just cheaper money flowing through and inflating asset values, not creating any underlying value. So I like this economy better, although the returns aren't as good. But as you know, interest rates are going to go come up and then probably come down. And To illustrate what the market is predicting right now, if you look at, say, Westpac, for example, they're saying peak cash rate is going to be 4.1%. This is Bill Evans, who's a very respected economist, a senior economist for Westpac. He is predicting seven rate cuts from 2024 as well. So even if half of that's right. Seven rate cuts. That's right. So they're going to need to stimulate growth at some point because – this will cause damage and uh, yeah, the rate cuts are predicted to be on the way next year and not just one of them. He's predicting seven and yeah, he's, he's one economist, but uh, I think you're going to see that theme come up more and more uh, because, you know, the goal is to bring inflation down and the way of doing that is to hurt the economy. Unemployment might rise. People might start defaulting on mortgages. And once that all starts happening, it's going to move quite quick and to stabilise things, you'll probably need to drop rates pretty quickly. So there's quite a few moving parts there. Um, So this, and I sort of referenced at the top of this podcast, what the Reserve Bank is trying to do is to curb inflation right now, and that's the reason why they're rising rates. We're starting to see the impact. We're getting towards the top. Your point there is that Bill Evans, the Westpac economist, uh, is predicting rate cuts. So once, so what you're saying is that once the RBA has served the purpose of rising rates, they'll bring it back into a a more neutral position. It's never going to go back down to 0.1%. I can't see that ever happening again. But your point is, Scott, and I'm just trying to, just, just listening and, and to summarise that for our listeners, um, your cash return on commercial investments, if you're leveraged, is not going to be good. Or it's not going to be as good through this period as we go through this sort of a rate stabilisation. However, what you're saying, though, is going to positively reset the value of your commercial assets because rents are higher and rents are very much a mechanism for how banks and lenders value your property. So if rents go up and you need a mechanism for your rents to go up and hopefully a lot of people when they negotiate their contracts, there'll be some sort of step rent increase through it. And if you're on a CPI rent review each year, that's pretty positive because it's been sort of 7% or so. A lot of people will sort of factor in fixed sort of 4% inside of their uh, commercial leases. But what you're saying, though, is that mechanism of increasing the rents will support greater valuation of properties moving forward. So your property values are going to hold firm. Is that the summary? Correct. And not only that, once those interest rates drop, if they drop, when they drop, that baseline rent is now higher. So it's probably going to push it into the, the highest ever capital value because now we've got more rental income. So rental income is a long-term growth pattern, which is, it's a slower, like, it's not like the sugar hit that we were getting in the uh, 2020 to 21, 22, you know, once rates dropped. Um, But yeah, it's real value and that's going to sort of last a lot longer. And if rates drop, it's going to create very good cash flow for the investors that got, got in at the right yield at least. And I'm very bullish for that reason. I think it's a good time to buy now because you can get a discount and, you know, it's better than it was last year. Uh, you just got to look past the returns and the returns are still pretty good. Remember, you just got to accept a decent day one yield. Like I'll use a real quick high level example. Like 
you know, excuse the number, it's just one of the last deals we did. It was a $3.864 million property. It was a 6.5 net yield, so that's 250 grand income, uh, 70% debt. The current interest rate, which was about 5.6 for the client, he was going to clear $101,000 with that. Now, if you scale that back to what the interest rates were last year, let's say it was a 2.5% interest, which they were, the income of that would have been 180000 So it's dropped from 180 to 110. Now, there is a cash component in this. You know, it's 30% cash. So not everyone has that for a big deal, but uh, that's a pretty good return on investment. You know, like you're still positively geared and that's why you're not seeing the commercial markets fall at the same rate as you are with residential because I'm not seeing anyone go under. Like it's hard to go under with commercial property unless you've got no tenant. Because if there is a tenant there or multiple tenants, then your interest is getting covered. And some may argue, well, what if it was 100% debt? You know, you're still, you know, unless the thing was under your interest rate, which, you know, it's 5.6%. So unless you're going out there and buying a 3% yielding asset, which you'd be crazy to, again, you're going to, you're going to even break even as long as you're hitting, you know, just aim for over 6% and you're good. And then once the interest rate drops, there could be some yield compression and that rent just keeps growing each year as well. So if the rent grows 5%, you've got 5% extra capital value, assuming the cap rate of the market is the same. So it's not a bad story. The equation stacks. So I've been chatting with a lot of property investors and sort of, you know, coming secondhand through different channels that, that I'm sort of connected with. And there's a lot of really concerned pumpers out there. You know, they've got the jibbers with, you know, their ability to continue to, grow as a property investor because they're committed into significant debt inside of a, a commercial asset and it's um you know decreasing serviceability. There's also people who have lease stock type loans and they're really, really worried about the value of their assets holding up and, and the bank sort of saying, you know, you're in pretty significant negative equity here. What well, what do you say to all that, Scott? Well, it's something like interest rates have gone up, the asset values haven't dropped. Like they've dropped to a Remember, the yields got a little bit uh, higher, but if you're bought into a good growing rental market, then your asset value is almost the same, if not better than it was last year. So the values, and you, we're not yet to see those negative situations. Um, if you lost your tenant and you revalued it at that point, there would be a situation of a negative equity while there's no tenant, there's no income. Banks are not calling loans in. They're actually extremely actively trying to go for market share in this space. So they're going to work with investors particularly commercial right now, to acquire them uh, and take them from other sources. And and it's really reflective in the fact that you, you don't have to pay application fees and stuff like that with commercial. Like I remember one of my commercial properties a few years ago, I had to pay $70,000 on an application fee. I got a larger loan three months ago and I paid zero. So the banks would never have waived that fee if they didn't want me as a client. And when my clients sort of ask, should we pay application fees? The answer is no, you should be pushing back on your bank. Maybe even run a tandem finance process if you are purchasing so you can avoid that cost. Um, but yeah, that, it's a pretty healthy market. You've just got to be wary of there is a, a two-speed commercial market because the lower yielding assets, you know, if you went and bought a service station at a 4% yield last year, that's not a good situation because the demand for that lower yielding asset is now significantly lower. But if you bought a 7% asset, like for example, the one you bought in uh, your super fill, that would have more, I think even more buyers than it did last year. Like we're, we're seeing our volumes in our company, like we did 48 properties in February. Like that's one of our busiest months. So the demand is there, but mm-hmm. people are shifting towards wanting higher yielding assets. There's no, no scooting around that fact. There's definitely weakness in the lower yielding markets and and you can see it with the auctions that go each month with those major sales companies. They are, you can see the yield expanding under their feet and because investors can't accept lower yields and that's probably where you're going to see those negative situations. Yeah, and and I think there's something we should keep keep across and on top of and if anyone's got any questions, whether it's generic or or quite detailed, um, I'm happy to answer them on uh, inside uh, commercial property. Scott, what's the best email address for people to contact us on? Uh, info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. That's the spot you need to be. Now, you mentioned um, investing in, in your SMSF, Scott, and, and in markets like this where you do get some uh, compressions um, on on cash flow, depending on the asset class you're working, it's, it's 
If you're investing inside of your stock managed super fund, and this is not advice in any way whatsoever, it's just a very generic conversation around it, but it's a little bit more forgiving investing inside of your uh, SMSF. Uh, it's isolated and uh, you have this sort of two-speed, I guess, market of um, contributions coming through by way of rent and also uh, contributions by way of your superannuation contributions. So that sort of level of isolation sort of supports negativity in cash flow should you find uh, yourself there, Scott. But this is this is sort of politics meets commercial property. You see the um, the treasurer is uh, pretty active at the moment around um, superannuation balances and, and having a good crack at that. Can you see any impact for commercial property for people who particularly operate inside of SMSFs if, if it's curbed, the amount of um, assets are able to hold in there with the sort of, I guess, the tax, tax effectiveness of holding assets inside of your self-managed super? Yeah, look, I think generally a lot of the, the deals we do in super are under three million as well. But yeah, if, the, if, if there is a sort of a, a cap, there's going to be less properties and super fund purchases. And you've got to remember a lot of the interest rates you, you get in these super funds are probably two or three percent higher than outside. So, you know, if you are an investor who wants to leverage, which I think any smart investor should, you know, like a fund manager doesn't just buy it with cash. You buy generally 50, 55 percent debt because you can maximize your returns. However, when you've got that really high interest rate in a super account, it, it does diminish the returns to a degree. So, yeah, like there's not going to be as much lending, I don't think, in that space. And um, yeah, if the tax effectiveness is not a good over a certain point, then yeah, less people will be buying properties and super funds. And, you know, if they're playing around with capital gains, taxes and stuff like that, that's going to be a further detriment to any asset class, to be honest. It's going to stop investment or at least reduce it. But it's a small number of people. Like I heard on the radio, it might be 10,000 people affected. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not, not sure if that fact's Correct, but uh, yeah, that's it's not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, well, it goes to show some of the tinkering you get when when new governments come in, and no doubt the current government would like people to be putting their money into industry funds. That's where um, a lot of it goes, and uh, that's you know, it's good money that's used for infrastructure projects. So everyone wins somewhere in the end. But I'll, I don't do it anymore, Scott. I, I don't even look at my share portfolio anymore. I just put my head in my hand and just shake my head, saying, "Why don't I just put that money in property?" Uh, again, that's not that's just my personal view of it. But um, yes, it hasn't been a great run. But you know, all asset classes swing in roundabouts. Uh, commercial property, absolutely being one of them. One of the catalysts for us to create this particular podcast is to have sort of informed discussions around investing in commercial. The point uh, that we made very on in this series, Scott, was um, at a point in time, uh, commercial property investors uh, will start considering commercial. Resi would start committing commercial. It's normally around a, a cash flow yield play as they get a more mature portfolio. And I start thinking about a cash flow management. We're in an environment now where the cash returns aren't as good. So if you're able to keep an eye on your debt levels, if you're able to keep an eye on and ensure you've got the most appropriate rate at any given time to service the debt that you have with a consciousness that it's going to hamper potentially serviceability. Um, but everyone's getting smashed on serviceability uh, right now, Scott, and hopefully that will ameliorate after uh, rates start uh, coming back to these cuts that you were mentioned beforehand. But there is a lot of cash buyers in the market as well, and I know a lot of people right now with with, with good cash coffers who are out there sort of, you know, hunting commercial assets um, uh, for many of the reasons we spoke about for long-term cash creation, but also generational cash creation. So that's happening. But, Scott, I've seen some deals coming through recently um, and they, they make sort of headlines. Um, and I sometimes sit there and scratch my head and go, I'm not too sure if that's a good buy or someone's paying way overs on this. And I'm trying to understand that the even if people are cash buyers, you know, skewing sort of yielding assets at sort of 3, 3.5%, they've got to be able to deploy their money better elsewhere, would be my view. Are you seeing any of these deals coming over where you just sort of scratch your head and say, I don't get it? Yeah, and it's quite big in our industry because, you know, we all talk and, you know, there's big auction houses that run and they, they generally sell those kind of like long leases, safety net type properties. So service stations, child cares, fast food places. And, uh, it is actually staggering the prices they achieve sometimes. And as an investor who's a return sensitive, you know, investor, we want good return on money and cash or no cash. Even if you've got a ten million in cash, you should be either splitting it between two ten million dollar properties, fifty percent leverage. Then you've got twenty mil of assets. You diversify. It's lower risk. You know, the debt is is twice over covered. And uh, 
Yeah, but some people, there's a lack of education. And this is one of my bugbears in the commercial world because it doesn't happen in residential very rarely where someone may overpay 30, 40% and have no idea they've done it. But how do you value a fast food place in, you know, regional Australia when they don't sell them often? You know, people buy on a yield at the time and it's kind of frightening to see people get ripped off sometimes to the sum of millions of dollars and have no clue what happened. And and then you see the uh, the results paraded all over the internet, you know, the service stations sold in West Melbourne at 2.6% yields and stuff like that. And you think, why would someone buy a service station at a 2.6% yield, especially now the cash rate's higher than that, and then it might be a fixed 3% increase, so there's no upside in the rent. There's no upside in the the actual asset when you know these assets. It's just a safe play. They look at a lease and they get almost romantic over the lease to go, this is, I'm going to go all in because it's a long lease. And, and it's a big mistake we see many investors make and we try to educate them to go, it's not just about the lease because businesses will come and go and the lease is, even if it lasts the entire lease, it you when you're the more experienced investors would almost rather shorter leases because you can get a better deal up the front. And we all know that tenants renew leases as well. So a three by three by three year lease generally equates to a nine year lease anyway. It just comes in portions, but then you get market reviews at the end of each lease. Every time that happens, you could get capital gains as well. So yeah, there's been a few recent sales that, yeah, you're right, Philip, we've been shaking our heads and uh, you know, I have hundreds of clients email and go, what was this buyer thinking? And it's sometimes they just don't know any better and they they get, like I said, a bit romantic over a lease and pay a lot more than they should. You make an interesting point that is you don't see people often in resident residential investors overpaying for assets. There's a whether it's there's a, a greater appreciation of value or it's simpler to value properties for residential purposes because you have so much like-for-like comparison in any given area. Back to back to Docklands, I'm, I'm sitting here right now and I could probably see, you know, probably about 500 sort of villas and a couple of thousand apartments, right? Like there is – and I was actually sitting here sort of scrolling through uh, yesterday price points here. Like you know what something is worth, right? If you pay over, you might pay over by five, ten grand, right? You're not going to – you're not paying over by 20 or 30 percent. Um, same doesn't apply in, in, in commercial property. It's because you know some of those assets you spoke about are relatively unique, and hence the reason why maybe that's the romanticism of it saying, hey, this is such a unique property, it's always going to be valued. I'm happy to pay a little bit over on it. But it's hard to compare and contrast, and that comes down to education and whether you know maybe it's sort of lends itself to what you do for a living, but it's hard to be an armchair. A commercial property investor, you know, where you can look up on on realestate.com there and go, yeah, I reckon that's worth about this plus or minus maybe a couple of grand. It's it's easier to get a lot wrong in commercial property because you need to understand the the valuation methodologies and the mindsets around it and the moving parts from it. And that is the capital value of the property where it is locational and sort of stuff. But it's the underlying economics of it, as in how much money does it make, how long is the lease, what is the structure of the lease to support long term cash growth. And that's a lot more complicated. And maybe that's the reason why people get it more wrong, Scott. Yeah. And one of my big goals as a professional is just to educate as much as possible out there because, you know, it's not it's not nice seeing, you know, people almost get hoodwinked in, in these situations, you know, like a Crown Casino auction and then uh, next minute they've paid $5 million for a, a small fast food place in Western you know, Western New South Wales or out in South Australia somewhere like rural areas and you think $5 million, if you actually know what to do with that, you can buy a blue chip asset in the middle of a capital city at a better yield with a lot more upside and I guess that's my job to find good investments and, um, you know, sometimes just yeah, trying to understand the psyche of, of people is is good for all investors to think, you know, and um, that's why it's it's very important to guess not just focus on the safety of a property too because I believe that's the main reason people overpay. They get uh, a little bit too comfortable with overpaying just because it's a security play, parking up capital play. But, you know, it, it, a lot of these people like, you know, imagine, uh, you know, you someone, uh, you know, one of your grandparents uh, passed away, passed it on to, you know, a single mother and they had five, six million cash and they just needed to park it into something. They will go to one of these auctions and get ripped off. And 
that's something I'm just trying to call out a little bit more in the industry because uh, we all talk and we all, I have hundred like I talk to hundreds of agents a week and yeah, even, even them question like, how do these results happen? You know, just because they're a cash buyer, like they can't achieve it themselves as well, but it's just something about the auctions that, uh, yeah, maybe people get competitive at them. I, I don't even know, but, uh, it does not happen in residential. And that's the really interesting thing. I don't think it happens in any other asset class. It's just this asset class, you can either do very well or go way over the top. And you, if you don't know what you're doing, you probably won't even know until that lease is over. Yeah, and, and probably that's the reason why traditionally commercial probably doesn't attract the masses, right? They're probably, maybe they're shrewd enough to go, no, nah, it's beyond my ability. Or they go the other pathway and they go, oh, I need I need a really good team to help me make sure I do the right stuff. And that's the reason why people buy agents and other top professionals. But it comes back to the fundamental premise, and you, you mentioned this, Scott, is where do you deploy your capital for the best outcome? People invest in property generally because they want long-term value creation, whether it's capital growth or yield or, or both, right? Um, why are they doing that? Because at a point in time, they can sell it and not have to work anymore or have a, a better retirement, or they are looking for some sort of long-term generational wealth creation strategy. Like, it doesn't really matter what it is, right? But how well do you deploy your capital at any point in time? The same thing applies in residential property. It gets spoken about all the time. Why would you invest in that location when you can invest in this location with this asset and you are able to achieve either of those things or both uh, capital growth or or um, rent increase or good yields, right? Not happening in the commercial. Maybe that's the point. You s- stick on it, mate. Keep flying the flag for education around commercial. Probably one of the reasons why uh, we've done this. And if you've got any questions to Scott, you can email him on that email, just as we said before. But I don't want to be the merchant of doom and gloom when it comes to uh, commercial property uh, right now. Scott, there is some um, concerns that a lot of people are having around it as an investment class, as an asset class, and that happens when markets change, and that's the right thing. You should be curious. Uh, you should be alert, not alarmed. You should be making informed decisions around a commercial investment. Uh, to Scott's point, like the residential market, in markets of flux and change is when counter-cyclical investors typically do their best work. So I'd say we're definitely in that right now. You just got to get in the right headspace mindset, have the right financial capability and support, and then also getting the right team around you. But there is some still some good deals going on out there, isn't it, Scott? You've seen some good stuff coming over your desk that you're securing. Tell us about some. Yeah, so as a general rule, you want to target investments with 6% net or better. And that, no matter what it is, unless there's like significant initial upside or there's just some kind of really big X factor about the property, but there's no reason why you should be accepting yields much lower than 6%. So that kind of rules out a lot of those types of investments we were mentioning before because um, they're the ones that are going to suffer the greatest price falls because the higher the interest rates go, the more the lower yielding assets get punished. It pushes more people to seek cash flow. And th- this is the environment we're in. We don't know how long it'll go for, but uh, we're finding the high yielding assets have got more demand than ever. And it's just because people are in cash flow holes at the moment. You know, they need to fix portfolios. And if they are to take debt on, it needs to be worth it. And 6% is kind of that. I guess the equilibrium in the market where we see the demand really rage higher above that and then drop off significantly under. So that's, you know, as of today, that's sort of the number. It may go higher. You know, you might need 6.25% if rates go higher. But um, yeah, generally, the average interest rate my clients are getting are in the mid fives, like maybe 5.5, 5.75, like these types of numbers. So, you know, that's sort of where that 6% is coming because you're going to be ahead for the short term. Then you've got rental increases that should happen within 12 months and then hopefully interest rates drop. So the equation will get a lot better. Uh, so so, so you, you're sort of saying sort of dry powder, right? So if you're, if you're buying commercial right now, you should be expecting a neutral yield but you could be acquiring assets in this point in time if they've got the right upsides where you'll see that arbitrage difference once rates start coming back. And that's on the basis that lenders will pass on rate cuts when they start happening, right? Like that's going to be a completely different thing. But um, that's the strategy at the moment, is it? Yeah, and that's based if you're doing 100% debt, which mm. I'd, I'd say maybe a quarter of buyers are doing that. So there is a lot of cash. Like we saved $280 billion in COVID as Australians. Um, so... There's a lot of cash out there, and that's the reason why people can accept lower yields. Um, but yeah, if you're working off 100% debt, they're the types of numbers you need to break even. But just remember, that's not your lifelong equation. It's very important to remember that. If you can get in now, 
then the rental increases hit, then the interest rates drop, there's going to be a very big widening of your cash flow and that will create instant equity. And that's the benefit of being a counter-cyclical investor. If you can look past the negativity of the market, because it is not as good now, you're not going to be retiring on the same level of debt as you would last, you know, compared to last year. You know, it's harder. But we're already seeing benefits of that. And that's that 0.75% expansion of yield we've probably seen on average around the country, which, you know, that could be a 10% drop in price, you know, or at least you're getting a 10% better return, you know, versus the rent you're getting. And um that's significant, I think. It's like there's a if you look back at all the big booms and busts in Australia history, like 10% fall rates are generally what's it been, and then it kind of recovers pretty quick. And if if the talk of the interest rate rises uh, keep coming a little bit quicker, then the bottom might be closer than you think. So no one knows. We definitely don't, but it'll be it'll be very interesting to to sort of see when that gap starts widening for the cash flow for commercial investors. Yeah, and would you be messing around with least stock loans in this environment? It's harder. Yeah. So I've heard, um, you know, they've gone from 70% lease stock. They still do 60, 65, but, you know, a lot of them are doing 50% lease, lease stock loans now. So the banks have definitely pulled the reins in. And this is the reason the market is tougher to buy in. Like, and banks engineer the market, in, you know, it creates the result really. When lending gets tougher, that's why prices fall. It's the biggest macro, you know, macro factor for price growth or falls by a fair bit, I think, um, because it affects the whole country. And, yeah, if we see lending it tougher, which it does in downturns, it's harder to buy, but then when it gets easier to lend, that's when the price expansion starts. And, you know, I don't think it'll happen this year or it might towards the end of the year, but it's going to be a sideways year for for commercial overall. And they're the best ones to buy. And, you like, you know, I heard uh, – there's a lot of people out there, famous real estate agents uh, that say this, it's better to buy in a falling market than a rising market because the falls are never going to be hugely significant. You're never going to time the market perfectly, but you can negotiate a lot better when it's falling because of these factors. And that's where I've been most active as an investor. And you know, once it starts getting red hot, that's when it's probably time to probably hold off more so than uh, we're talking now. Yeah, well, that's um, smart cancel. Scott, it's always good to get together, mate. Um, I think we'll enjoy the uh, 2023 and as we move into 2024 watching this market. And I think it's just a clear reminder that property doesn't work in a linear fashion. It's just not a straight line going up. Uh, your your value, it, it moves, it wobbles, it goes left and right. And there is, again, this particular market gives you some sense for how all the sort of macro and micro economic factors and everything else that is shaping and influence of the economy or compounds into changing the way in which commercial property operates. So the better informed and engaged you are around it, the better you understand it, the better off you'll be. And for, for most of us, myself included, just go and speak to someone who knows what they're doing and uh, trying to do it rather than trying to do it all yourself. Um, that's probably a pretty smart thing to do. Scott, good mate. If anyone wants to have a yarn to you, just contact you through info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Is there a Facebook or anything like that, mate, that you prefer to use? Oh, Facebook or, or just Google Rethink Investing and come yeah. through the main line and, yeah, always happy to have a chat about people's entire portfolios, you know, portfolio review type stuff and, um, and yeah, and just remind them that, uh, yeah, like you said, all years aren't great and there's a lot of people hurting from interest rates, particularly if you've gone and, you know, loaded up on a large family home and, you know, prices have fallen like just remember this is all temporary and, and this is where good investors have a, a mindset to get through these times and no one is going to feel richer this year than they did last year and, and sometimes that kind of backwards feeling can bother people but, uh, you know, next year is another year and I think, yeah, if you get through it, um, hold on to your assets. I think it'll pay off. There you go, Scott O'Neill, Director of Rethink Investing. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, Bill. You too. Nice one. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, inside commercial property. We'll see you next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.